Um, and I want to just start off by really diving deep into sort of the key um, theme, which is deterrence. Um, earlier this year, or, or sorry, earlier this month, um, the Pentagon's congressionally mandated um, China military report came out. And the biggest takeaway for me personally was just how quickly China is making advances, not just in one field, but across the board, whether we talk about hypersonic, nuclear weapons, um, AI, technology, and just its military in general. And so, Admiral, I just want to start off by asking you, um, how can the United States say it's being effective in deterrence when we're seeing by the Pentagon's own metrics, China making rapid progress and essentially doing what it wants in the region? That's, well, thanks for that. First, I'm honored to be here with such a distinguished panel. Uh, measuring deterrence. That's a pretty complex task, right? So you could go to the easiest side of that measurement that says we're not at war, so we're winning. Uh, but it's much more complex than that. Uh, I would articulate that we are delivering deterrence. Uh, it's aligned with what the Secretary talked about at lunch, right? So integrated deterrence, the integration of all forms of national power with the military component, the joint force, our allies and partners, operating in concert every day to prevent conflict. Uh, we do that through campaigning. We do that through exercises. We do that through the delivery of capabilities. And I thank Kathy yesterday for an amazing rollout of the B-21. That should be concerning to all of our adversaries. Uh, so uh, what I would say is our actions every day are taken in the Indo-Pacific Command to prevent this conflict. Uh, and, and I would articulate that we're certainly having the right effect at this point. Congressman Wilton, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Do you think there is effective deterrence right now? And you were in the region not too long ago. Do you think our allies see deterrence as there, or do they want more to be done? Well, I think we, we can all agree that, that we want more to be done. And Admiral Aquilino and uh, the men and women who serve under him are doing an extraordinary job. I saw that. That's one of the things we witnessed, the partnership uh, between our troops and our allies. I watched an amphibious landing of U.S. Marines, ROC Marines from South Korea, and Filipino Marines. The mill-to-mill -mill cooperation was excellent. And at that level, our allies are right there with us. I do think that we have some work to do on the politics, and this gets back to the Admiral's point about integrated deterrence. This is not just about having a military that's ready or a military that's ready to cooperate with our allies. It's about having a whole-of-government approach to deterrence and, and security. I think that the strategy that we are being briefed in Washington is understood uh, by the commanders in the field and the troops on the ground, but I don't think it's being implemented quickly enough to really meet the timelines that, uh, that, that, that we're facing. Mm -hmm. There's more that we can do to move faster, but of course, that's nothing new. Uh, that's, that's an age-old problem in our uh, international security. And then I also think that there's probably more we need to do in the department of translating all of these preparations into actual deterrence for China. There is no question in Moscow about the consequences of launching a nuclear attack on the United States during Soviet times. They knew exactly what we would do in response. There's a certain degree to which we obviously want to keep our capabilities from China hidden, and our most advanced capabilities today are things that China doesn't understand. But I think there's also more that we can do to telegraph the type of whole of nation allied together response that we would have if China were to become more aggressive. Because that ultimately is what forms the foundation of deterrence. Senator Rounds, what does that effective deterrence look like, not just in the physical deterrence, but the economic, cyber? What does that look like? When we talk about deterrence, we're talking about whatever it would take to convince someone that they don't want to do something stupid. And the bottom line is, is that if you're talking about Russia, they clearly understand what happens if they misbehave and they bring us into a war. China, on the other hand, has pushed the limits. Uh, it's in a gray area. They're wondering how much they can get away with before we would actually engage. We're a country that's not necessarily known for wanting a war. And so for them, it's a matter of how far do they push? And at what point do they get to the point where there is actual response from us? And what should that response be? 
Now, diplomatically, we talk about, well, we can push sanctions. Perhaps we can tell them how much we disagree with them. But the bottom line is, is they respect force. And they want to understand consistently that if they get so far along that there's going to be a response that is expected. Well, if we're talking about economics, it means that we can offer the sanctions. It means that we can show them that we can grow without them and that we may very well not let them grow at the same pace as they have in the past because we may not participate in their economy. But it all comes back down to whether or not we have a defense, a defense system in this country which is second to none and there is no misunderstanding as to our capabilities and our resolve to use it. Now that's the political side and what they look at, we can talk all day long. But the question is, is do we have every single year an appropriations process for defense that's working and supported? Do we have a, a National Defense Authorization Act which is primary and which is absolutely supported in both houses consistently? Those are the things that they look at. And then finally they look at whether or not do we have the strategic weapons that can put them at a real disadvantage? And what we had last night, where the B-21 was rolled out, and I'm not going to take your thunder away, <laughs> Please but, I will, but, but, I, but I will say this. If there was ever a badass weapon of war and peace, it's the B-21 bomber. And, and, and this, is, this one will be here for a long, long time, as long as the policymakers have the resolve to be consistent in a message that cannot be misunderstood. Ms. Horton, just, just on that point, from, from, from your standpoint in, in private industry, what does deterrence look like, not just with the B-21 bomber, which uh, you, know, you can talk about the role that could play in the Indo-Pacific, but generally in arming the region and getting them prepared as a deterrent for China? How, how, how does that work and how do you look at it from your perch? Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly think of us in a competition, not just the uh, U.S. with China, but the U.S. industrial base with the Chinese industrial base. And that means that this isn't just about how much capacity and capability we're amassing, it's how quickly we can adapt to new technological change and bring that to the force structure. But I would say I am optimistic that the American industrial base is incredibly strong in that regard. We're innovative, we are able to work with partners, we're collaborative, and that has been the strength of the industrial base up until this point that has led to the strong deterrent we have. And yes, we're in the 21st century, so we need to adapt, both in terms of our philosophy around deterrence and also the capabilities that underpin it, but we are doing that, we are modernizing. And to the point the senator made last night was a show of that, and we need to be able to have those types of capabilities available to people like Admiral Aquilino to back up the deterrent, but it's there. If I could just follow up on that very quickly with you, Ms. Warden. Um, you know, the way it's been described is the aim is to make Taiwan a porcupine, where it makes it so difficult for China to invade and hold it, they don't do it, right? Um, in, in July, you said Western governments needed to provide a, quote, clear demand signal if industry was going to provide weapons for a prolonged con uh, conflict with Ukraine. When we look at Taiwan and China, are you getting the demand signals from government right now, or do you think they need to do more for you to be prepared? I personally think the demand signal is quite clear. The national defense strategy is clear and concise about what is needed. And the most important underpinning is that appropriations are made in alignment with that national defense strategy and that that happens in a timely fashion so that we are able to move forward with momentum and consistency. And so that demand signal at any given time around any given system may need some clarity, but I feel we have really good strategic clarity at this point in time. And as an industrial base, we are pulling together around that clarity and are up to the task of delivering what our nation needs. Um, I sort of wanted to talk about one specific um, event, recent event, and that's the protest in China over the COVID restrictions. We've seen in countries when protests start, they do uh, lash out militarily in the foreign policy arena. The protests have died down now, but have you seen or are you expecting China to sort of 
ramp up militarily in the South China Sea as a way to deter from some of the internal protests? Uh, <clears throat> it's certainly an issue that we watch out for, right? The internal issues going on inside of mainland China are, are not uh, specifically associated with internal. There's, cert there's an opportunity or a potential for those to influence the external operation. So uh, if you just listen to Ms. Haynes, we watch those very closely. Uh, the potential is there. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, our operations are designed to deter whether there's internal issues or not in, uh, in the PRC. Uh, there's economic issues as well. So uh, again, understanding the state of play uh, and always looking at most likely and then most dangerous outcomes uh, allows us to position plan and prepare. Have you seen anything yet, though? Uh, not at this point, uh, but it's early. If you look at where uh, China is with regard to COVID, I think you could take a flashback to where we might have been two years ago. And what does that look like uh, if they do open up? And how does that impact their population? We'll, uh, we'll continue to watch it closely. And, and the second question I had is something that has confused me for a while, and that's the Davidson window, which is the concept that China will militarily look to invade Taiwan by 2027. That was put on the sort of map last year, and since then we've had different timelines. Um, Admiral Gilday has said it could happen earlier. Secretary Blinken uh, the other day said he believes <coughs> China is speeding up plans to seize Taiwan. Could you just clarify, as the head of Indo-Pacific Command, how you're looking at this? Is it 2027? Is it earlier? Is it later? Uh, I get this question often. I give the same answer. <clears throat> if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd be in Vegas. <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah. but, but that said, uh, again, there's a variety of different uh, opinions on what might occur. What I can tell you is, you know, Secretary Austin's given us a task. Number one, to prevent conflict with the PRC by executing our, de executing our deterrence options. Uh, and if deterrence were to fail, then be able to fight and win our nation's wars. Mm -hmm. So for me, the timeline is, is uh, it almost doesn't matter because we do have to be prepared today and we're taking all those actions. Um, Congressman Moulton, I, I wanted to come to the concept or, or the policy that the, uh, the administration and, and the United States generally has a strategic ambiguity on, on China and Taiwan. Do you believe the administration should be clear about what the United States would do if China tried to militarily invade Taiwan? Well, first of all, I think that this administration has been a bit clearer about, um, about our commitment. Um, but it, it's in the context, I think, of, of two points that, I, that, that are really relevant to your, to your last question to the, to the Admiral. The first is that there's a big debate among China watchers, both economic watchers and defense watchers, <coughs> as to whether China is 10 feet tall and they're on this uh, r rapid rise that will continue <coughs> into the foreseeable future, or whether they're cresting, whether their economic problems or demographic problems and other issues are really going to come uh, to limit their growth significantly. And the implication of that question is we don't need to be as worried about China if they're not 10 feet tall. I I'm in the camp of looking at, I'm not an economist, but looking at these uh, analyses and, and believing that China probably is not 10 feet tall, that, that they're not going to continue the growth rates that we've seen. But I actually think that makes that, that, that makes it more likely Xi Jinping tries some foreign adventure. There are a lot of differences between Russia and China. They're very different countries. Uh, but Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin have a lot in common in terms of their self-aggrandizing uh, ambitions when it comes to foreign conquest. And the fact that China might have more domestic trouble at home, whether it's with their economy or their protests or anything else, I think has to uh, keep us more apprised of the, the risk that he invades. The second point, real quickly, is uh, I fondly remember traveling on one of my first Codels to, uh, to Eastern Europe with then Chairman Mac Thornberry in 2015. And we were shocked to see the degree to which Russia was playing this gray zone game where they were influencing democracies with little green men and, and cyber operations and other things, uh, really trying to influence the governance of uh, Eastern European nations. That was 2015. We came back, we worked together on bolstering our support for Eastern Europe to counter this hybrid warfare threat. I never imagined that Russia might try to use that against us the very next year, thousands of miles away. Right now in the Pacific, China is doing a lot of gray zone activity. 
you know, just since the speaker's visit, they've pushed that imaginary line in the Taiwan Strait closer to Taiwan. The more they can get away with this, the same degree to which Putin got away with this for years in Eastern Europe with really no NATO response, may embolden Xi to think that they're not going to do anything. So I think we've got to be cognizant not just of our plans to counter China if they actually invade Taiwan, but what we're doing in the immediate term to deter the kind of aggressive behavior that we're seeing day to day. I think it's a good time to bring up the Reagan um, polling uh, that was done on some questions related to China. Um, I'll, I'll read it out, and, and basically the, the question that was asked is, do you think the US has a clear strategy for China? And 54% of respondents said no. Um, Senator Rounds, that's a pretty large number of respondents who do not believe the US has a clear strategy on China. Why do you think that is? Is it a communication problem uh, by the United States not to, to sort of make clear what it is? Or, or what should a, a clear strategy on China actually look like? Anybody in this room know what our clear policy is for China? See, look, we, we, we have a two China policy, supposedly. And yet, at the same time, we've said that we are going to assist Taiwan because we don't want to have them being invaded. That by itself is rather challenging. Uh, it, and it's true that you know what you want to be is, is solid, and, and you want to have no misunderstandings about what your position is. But I think the results over the last year or so have made it even more challenging. For, for, first of all, what happened in Afghanistan and the way that we left Afghanistan really put questions uh, in, in front of China. And they looked at this and said, "Is the United States withdrawing? Are, are they walking away from from their international interests? Do we have a time period here in which?" We have opportunities that we might not otherwise have had. Uh, second of all, uh, when we talk about where our efforts are at, and we're in, in assisting Ukraine, they're watching really closely as to how we're handling this Russian invasion of Ukraine. They're learning. They're not disinterested. And as they watch, they are trying to discern what our policy really is. Are we prepared to actually engage? My personal opinion on this is, is that while we don't have a very specific policy which is easy to define, there are a couple of things that we could do to make it clearer. Number one, we continue as quickly as we can in all domains in strengthening our capabilities. They respect that. They will follow that. And they understand that the, by, between now and the year 2027, we're going to continue to upgrade. What they're also concerned about is, is if we decide to turn Taiwan, with all due respect to Taiwan, into a porcupine, it makes it much more difficult for them and much, more, much less desirable for them to have bloodshed that they have to go back home and explain. They can't hide that. And so number one, if it was up to me, I would say be very, very clear that, that, that we have made agreements that we do not want to see a war, but that we're going to provide everything we can as quickly as we can to make life very miserable for the PRC if they're going to try to make an, an invasion. And second of all, watch and see what we're doing to strengthen our own military and our long-range strike capabilities. And the quicker that I think we can send that message, the, the better off that we're going to be. I think uh, uh, the, the government of China is smart. I think they listen. I think they observe. And I think they respect strength. And if we show ourselves in that capacity and we assist Taiwan in that same capacity, then they have to reconsider what their options are. And by the way, I'll say one last thing and then I'll shut up. China has got demographic problems, as Seth has suggested. Look, their, their total fertility, their TFR is 1.2. They are in an unsustainable decline in their population. They are not going to have a growing economy over the next 30 years. And they understand that as well. And so if they can't replace the population that they've got, they've got real problems. They understand that. So time is on our side, thus the reason for the explanation of a 2027 time frame. It's not perfect, but clearly it is one that we need to build as quickly as we can, not just in strategic weapons, but in munitions as well. Ms. Ron, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Warden, um, there was another part of the survey that asked uh, how many percentage points of Americans were in favor of supporting more arms to Taiwan. 
and 56% of respondents responded they would be in favor of providing more arms to Taiwan. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the United States' ability to fight two uh, or wars on two fronts, and I'm curious if that same concept is applied to industry. Is industry prepared to arm two allies at the same time? So my question is, you know, let's say next year you, the conflict in Ukraine is ongoing and China decides to militarily invade, or, or something lesser than that, Taiwan, which requires a huge uh, you know, flow of weapons. Is Northrop and is industry ready and prepared and able to provide weapons to two allies at the same time? Industry is absolutely prepared to provide capability to multiple allies, more than two, at one time. It goes back to having clarity, however, as to what we will provide to which allies. And there should be, and there is, different standards around exportability for different levels of uh, sophistication in weapon systems and the countries to which they go. I, I would say that is an area that we collectively could do better while we have a clear national defense strategy and it clearly aligns to providing our allies capabilities so that they can work in uh, combination and collaboration with the US, a little less strategic clarity on what capabilities we will give to each ally. And I think in particular with Taiwan, there is some gray space there. Um, Congressman Moulton, there was another interesting question that was asked in the survey. And it found that 46% of respondents said they are in favor of establishing a no-fly zone over areas that could involve shooting down, down a Chinese warplane in the event of a conflict. Um, and 43% are in support of committing ground troops to help defend Taiwan. Um, you were very vocally against the war in Iraq, and I'm not trying to compare the two situations, but do you think there is a situation where we are almost sleepwalking into a conflict with China given that such a large percentage of the population is willing to essentially go to war with China? No, I don't think we're walking, I don't think we're sleepwalking into it. And, and just to be clear, uh, when, when, I, when I went to Iraq as a young lieutenant, um, I, I was focused on the fight, I was not opposing, opposing the war. I was critical of the war. Uh, I wrote an op-ed in 2006 uh, uh, in between active duty tours uh, about how the war was being fought. But Look, I, I, I think that, that actually the problem uh, with, with China-Taiwan is that a lot of Americans don't understand the implications of this fight. I mean, you could wake up and have an aircraft carrier at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and we're not thinking about that. A lot of, a lot of constituents ask me, you know, what does it really matter? What, are, what, what does it matter to me? Why is Taiwan important to me? You saw where China-Taiwan ranked in the midterms in terms of important issues, and it wasn't even on the map. And yet when asked the question, what do I think is one of the biggest stories that no one's talking about, which is a frequent question I, I get in my job, this is my number one answer. So no, I don't think we're sleepwalking into a conflict. I think the challenge is that we have to explain to our constituents why it's so important that we devote the money and resources to make sure that we can win a conflict and therefore prevent it. And Malcolm, let me put that question to you. Why should Americans care about Taiwan and why should American troops potentially die for Taiwan? Uh, <clears throat> so from the military's perspective, uh, the first thing we always look at is certainly what's in the United States national interest, interests, uh, what's important. Uh, as it applies in the theater, uh, the region is, or the island is geographically and strategically uh, important. Uh, there's economic capabilities there that are important to the United States economy. Uh, there, it is a thriving democracy. Uh, the US standing in the region as it applies to our uh, ability to support allies, partners, and friends. Uh, there's, no, there's a number of reasons on why we believe it's important. That said, uh, as we started, this will be a policy issue uh, should it come down to uh, conflict. But bottom line is, at this point in time, it's, it's, it's an important place for all that's going on and for those national interests uh, and things that are important to the United States. Um, if I could sort of pivot to, 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 to a question about lessons being learned in Russia and Ukraine and, and sort of how everyone on the panel is sort of taking that in. And Ms. Warden, if I could start with you, you know, 
you've been very active over the past nine months. What lessons have you taken um, in the way you've worked with the Pentagon, the administration in arming Ukraine, and how is that informing um, or, or allowing you to make changes if and when you have to sort of move towards, um, for Ms. Warden, and then I'll come to Senator Rounds. A key lesson for us in the defense industrial base is that the demand signal sometimes can't be clear well in advance when conflict occurs. We need to have a sense of urgency in being able to respond. And so that means depth in the supply base. That means thinking about how production lines can remain more consistently uh, funded and supported. And that, of course, isn't something the industrial base can do alone, but it's work that we now are doing with the department that's important. I would say the other lesson is the importance of logistics. So certainly the Russian army is learning that. We understand that as we think about applying that lesson to Taiwan, the tyranny of distance makes that even more challenging. So as we think about all of the capabilities we build, are we building them to be sustainable, easily upgradable, and supportable? And then you know, the final lesson that I'm really taking away from the uh, lessons that we see there is for the defense industrial base, this is about technology to support modernization of a strategic deterrent, but it is also about balancing capabilities that our allies can get access to. And this brings me back to the point about exportability. We aren't going to hand over crown jewels like the B-21 to our allies, so we need a broad portfolio of capability, some of which is going to be exportable, some of which isn't, to create a broad strategic deterrent that both the US and our allies can participate in. Senator Rounds, how about you? I mean, I, I think it's important to remember Taiwan is not Ukraine, right? There are differences, but there are key takeaways that, that could be taken. We learned a lot about um, how our adversaries go to war, and China learned how to go to war. Uh, what we recognize now is it's not just air, land, and sea, it's also space and cyberspace. Uh, we saw cyber activity before we had kinetic activity. We know that uh, our space assets were extremely valuable and, 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 and continue to be to this date. We also recognize that uh, China clearly understands that in the way that we fight, uh, they're gonna go after our cyber capabilities and they're very good at it. And they're gonna go after our space-based assets. Uh, they recognize that if they can take out our space-based assets, that that blinds us. It makes us uh, less likely to be as efficient as we otherwise would be in terms of our ability to strike back to them. So number one, we have to harden those assets, or we have to protect them. And then we have to recognize also that th they're not gonna strike when we're expecting them to strike. Uh, they're gonna wait and they're gonna do it when it's opportune for them. But most certainly, they would. we're gonna see indications of it. We will see that they're gonna try to take out cyber uh, assets and space assets before they decide to come in uh, with some of their, their weapon systems. That would make sense to us anyway, and we would expect that, that that's one thing that we should be able to learn, that Xi Jinping clearly has learned from Ukraine in terms of our ability to assist Ukraine uh, was based upon the ongoing capabilities that we still had in effect. So uh, once again, this is a case of where they're gonna learn they're learning rapidly, and uh, we have to recognize that they can see the same things that we can see. Uh, Congressman Moulton, what about for you? And, and have you s noticed or sensed a shift by the Allies in them being more trusting of the United States in the way the US has dealt with Ukraine, or how are you seeing it when you um, travel? Yes, I think there has been a noticeable <clears throat> shift. And, and look, as a Democrat sitting next to my Republican friend here, I agree with exactly what you said about Afghanistan. I think that there was a concern after our botched withdrawal uh, that America was withdrawing from the world uh, and that we weren't going to be ready to fight. And I think that that sentiment has been entirely reversed uh, by our performance in Ukraine. So I have seen that, um, that shift. There are a lot of lessons, of course, that we've learned from Ukraine that apply to, to Taiwan. The lesson of intelligence sharing, uh, the, the value of information operations, where in many ways the Ukrainians have set the pace for us. They're the ones who've come up with the most uh, innovative I.O. campaigns. Um, the importance of stockpiling weapons. We can't wait till after the fact to help the Taiwans the way we've been able to do so uh, with Ukraine. Obviously, the importance of international alliances. 
and an international alliance is much easier to establish in a part of the world where you have a 70-year-old alliance pre-existing than it is in a part of the world where you have a lot of allies, but they're not very cohesive. So we have a lot of work to do in that department too. But I'll end by talking about uh, one of the most obvious uh, lessons from Ukraine, and that's about the importance of asymmetric capabilities. You know, when you have Ukrainians uh, using drones, oftentimes their own makeshift drones, uh, pretty cheap, to kill tanks, that's a huge innovation in warfare. And in part, they've been able to do that thanks to our capabilities, our intelligence sharing, our targeting. And obviously, we've provided them sp some specific NATO weapons that are better than their Russian counterparts. But if you looked on paper at our armies, right, we clearly have better training, we clearly have better leadership, we clearly have better doctrine than the Russians. But on paper, in terms of our materiel, our actual equipment, our military looks a lot more like Russia's. We are the two conventional forces. Ukraine and China are the ones who are investing disproportionately in asymmetric capabilities. So I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem when China is investing 10 times what we are investing in AI. And that's in proportional terms. Even in absolute terms, they're investing more money every single year in AI than we are. We can't let them get ahead on these things. We've got to learn the lesson of asymmetric capabilities ourselves from Ukraine. Great point, I'd like to come back to that in a bit. May I inject yes, one thing on in that? And, and I totally agree with what Seth has said. Oh, look, the, the, the issue of the will to fight can't be underestimated either. What we saw in Ukraine, very few people understood how strong they would defend their homeland. That same uh, amount of desire, that same strength, we have to be able to see in Taiwan as well. And I think that's gonna be one of the challenges that as a nation, that, that we're gonna be looking at is, is do we see that same desire for freedom that we see in, in Ukraine today? I'm not cool, you know, what lessons have you taken from Ukraine? Yeah, I learned a few. Uh, <laughs> we only have 19 minutes left, but let me, <laughs> let me go short. Uh, number one, first, uh, hey, this could happen in the Pacific region, okay? People are surprised in Europe. We shouldn't be surprised that it could happen in the Pacific. Point one. Point two, once the fight starts, it's going to be really hard to end, which means we ought to take action now. We need a sense of urgency to deliver the force, the capabilities, the industrial base, the budgets, and what is needed now to move as fast as possible to deliver deterrence and sustain our deterrent efforts. Because once the crisis starts, then it gets complicated. Now, uh, that's what I learned for two points. Additionally, uh, we need to meet our responsibilities as it applies to the Taiwan's Relation Act. We talked a little bit about that before, but quickly. And then lastly, there's a couple of things I, I hope that uh, the, my PRC counterparts learn. Okay, number one, taking on a military operation of this size and scope is complex. And when I say complex, right, everybody's surprised at the response the Russian army delivered. Uh, the PRC should not underestimate how difficult it would be to execute the event and achieve their objectives. Second, it's gonna cost blood and treasure. And the leadership's gonna have to explain that to their people. And when we talked before about internal problems to the PRC, those are internal problems that will complicate and certainly decision criteria on whether or not they go. But it will cost blood and it will cost treasure. Uh, what the United States has pulled together as applies to economic sanctions and what it's done uh, to the Russian economy. If you look at the globalized economy and how plugged in China is, we could have 500 times more devastating effects. A counter argument to that would be because the United States and China are so coupled together economically, the U.S. will feel pain just as much, maybe not just as much, but a lot of pain as well. And so the U.S. should, you know, from a Chinese perspective, be just as careful. Um, is that something you think through in terms of a potential conflict, the, the consequences for the U.S., right? If, if the U.S. Were to, were to help defend Taiwan, 
presumably it would take a huge amount of American lives as well. So we, we th certainly have thought through that as well. Uh, what I would articulate is our relationships and link with our allies and partners. Uh, on the economic side, if you were to take Japan, United States, and Korea's economy as alone, they dwarf the Chinese economy. Not even close. So when you think about like-minded nations coming together to deliver economic concerns, that's a pretty strong and tough problem for them to deal with. Uh, the last thing I'll bring up is reputationally, uh, which reputation is very important for the president of China. Uh, what does it do for him as it applies to his legacy? And what does it mean for the people of China if they were to take on an additional illegitimate war uh, in this day and age? So those are things, those are uh, important things that I think President Putin is learning, and I hope they translate. Mm -hmm. So I have a few more minutes before I turn over to questions. I just want to hit on one theme, which is alliances. And this word, uh, you know, t Taiwan is important. It's there. Um, could you talk a bit about sort of your efforts and industry efforts, not just to, to look at arming Taiwan, but allies throughout the region, whether it's Japan, South Korea, Philippines. <clears throat> um, is the process for that as easy as it should be? Is bureaucracy still coming in the way? If, if you could sort of talk about the broader um, theme of alliances from industry's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly agree that our allies are an important element of our national defense as we are to theirs. And so we have a common goal. And what's most important is that the US be clear-eyed about how we want to engage our allies, what kit we want to provide to them, how we want to bring them into uh, inner operations within our military structure. And what I have seen be laid out very clearly in the national defense strategy now with very little ambiguity is that that is our intent. We have a lot of work to do to take that intent into practice. And the defense industrial base goes around the world helping our allies to understand the capabilities we have and what we can sell to them. Uh, what we need to pair that with is a clear demand signal from the US that we will export those capabilities and very rapidly get them into the hands of our allies. And then that helps provide the clear demand signal we were mentioning earlier that industry can go facilitize and be able to support when that demand arises. Senator so Rounds, just, just on that topic of alliances, um, you know, when, when I talk to, to, to sources in, in the region, you know, they say, look, the U.S. is talking, you know, in the right way, even doing stuff the right way. But there is this sort of lingering hangover effect of the Trump administration and that administration's views towards alliances. What would you tell um, allies in the region two years from now when there might be a change in administration? Why should any ally trust the United States? I, I, I think the plan should have clarified perhaps that that there was a, a belief that the deals being made should have been made directly one-on-one, -on -one, rather than uh, a large group of countries coming together with a single deal. But they never got so far as to actually do the individual deals. I, I, I think the TPP would have been an excellent uh, a product to have incorporated in, but some of the folks then thought, well, look, if we make a, a deal with Japan, that's a huge amount of what you would have found in the TPP. So I, I think it was as much simply a matter of not being able to execute their long-term goals of being able to put together individual uh, trading packs with each of the countries in that area. I think my message out there right now would be we should get back into the middle of it and we should do as many trading deals as we possibly can. If the TPP was available for us to re-enter, we should re-enter it. Uh, and I think that would be important to do. But anything that we can do to strengthen our economic ties with our allies in the Pacific Rim region, we should be doing. And I think for, for Americans, we should once again remind them that 50% of all the trade in the world goes through this part of the world, it goes right through these straits. So this is not just simply a matter of saying we have, we have allies and friends in Taiwan. This is a matter of whether or not we want free trade to be able to move through this entire part of the world at a time in which an authoritarian country, China, truly believes that they have an entitlement to be able to control that part of the world. And, and, and this is serious, and this will impact the economy of the United States as well if we don't recognize that. So for me, we strengthen our ties. We actually do deals, including the TPP, if we could get back into it. 
Uh, but if not, individually, but get it in gear and get it done. And, and, I, don't, and I think that's the part that was perhaps never followed through with, is, is those individual trading deals, they're not as easy as what you think they are to do, but uh, I think that was the ultimate goal, was to have those one-on-one -on -one with other countries in the region. Let me add a quick comment about something that was happening throughout the Trump administration that, that, that I was fortunate to have a front row seat for. And that was bipartisan delegations of members of Congress going to our allies and saying, and it's usually the Republicans, to their credit, who spoke up on this, despite what you hear going on in the White House, we are here united as a bipartisan delegation, and we are with you, and we are still with you. That, for obvious reasons, wasn't public, but I admire uh, my Republican colleagues on both the Senate and House Armed Services Committee who were consistently delivering that message throughout the Trump administration, at least when we were able to travel. Of course, travel was curtailed for a while because of the pandemic. Well, let me follow up, and I say this with respect. It is great that the congressional delegations were saying we're with you, but why would an ally sort of believe that when the White House and the executive branch is showing otherwise? You know, there was talk at one point about Trump pulling troops out of South Korea. Yeah, look, look let, let me go back to one that, that I think. I, I went to Halifax um, after there was a discussion about whether or not all of the other NATO partners were anteing up appropriately. And, and they wanted to know, why are you guys talking about moving out of NATO? And, and our message to them is, we're not moving out of NATO. We really aren't. But we do think we have to draw attention to the fact that if you want a strong NATO, everybody's got to pull their fair share. And what's wrong with saying, look, guys, ante up? And, and I think sometimes that part of the message that the previous administration was trying to share gets lost in this. But I don't think there's anybody out there today that thinks that it's a mistake to ask NATO to ante up within their own defense budgets and pick up their fair share as well. We're picking it up, and, and we want them to as well. And I think they understand now the reason why we were so concerned with them also participating and bringing their defensive capabilities up as well. And, and I, I really think that was the goal to begin with, was to bring everybody in, make people accountable, and let them know that this is serious and that they're, when we make an, an Article 5 agreement that we're going to defend them, they need to also step in and, and, and honor their part of the deal, which is to put money into the defense of their own country, which then strengthens NATO. I think that was reasonable. That's a great answer, but let me offer a blunter answer to your question. How would you get allies to believe this? Essentially, what we were saying to them was don't believe everything that Donald Trump says. I don't think that was a hard sell. <laughs> Well, we might find out in two years if that's the case or not soon. Um, that actually does tee up my next question and, and potentially the last question for Admiral Aquilino, which is allies and are they doing enough in the region? Um, I'll give you an example. In Japan, right, they said they would double their defense spending as a percentage of GDP to 2% over five years. Is something like that enough and, and happening quick enough, or do they need to be faster in, in their investment, in their modernization, given that they are physically um, closer to China? Uh, before I get to that, let me start with, on the on the mill-to-mill -mill side of our relationships, uh, whatever administration aside, uh, those relationships have remained strong. Right? We exercise with those partners for decades, 150 exercises in the Indo-Pacific every year with our allies and partners. And they're increasing in size, scope, and scale as we work towards implementing uh, multilateral efforts and events uh, across the theater. So when we look at it uh, mill to mill wise, uh, I'm really encouraged. Uh, two days ago, I hosted a virtual Ch Chiefs of Defense conference with all of my counterparts in the region. We do that three times a year virtually two to three times, and then we do it once in person uh, in, in a place of, uh, of the child's choice. Uh, right, so that builds trust. When crisis comes, you don't surge trust. You need to have that all the time. And I can pick up the phone, I have all of their text, and we text quite a bit with regard to what's going on in their countries, uh, the, the most recent storms going through uh, the Philippines, I texted my buddy General Bacordo and said, hey, do you need anything, right? And I've gotten those texts back from those partners. That's the trust that we need to deliver, and it's directly in alignment with the strategy and our approach. Uh, now, whether or not they're contributing enough, those are policy issues. Uh, 
Our intent is to build interoperability, to increase our information sharing. In other words, I want a pickup game. When crisis occurs, no matter where we are, the forces in the region, in place, can come together and deliver the effects we want, whether it be humanitarian assistance or whether it be search and rescue, you name it. And uh, we've really been making strides on that. So from the United States mill-to-mill -mill perspective, we're in a really good place. Uh, and again, I call many of those guys my friends, not just partners or colleagues. Uh, and I look forward to continuing that. One last question before we go to audience uh, questions, and that is to do with North Korea and China. In May, uh, the White House declassified intel saying China, oh sorry, North Korea was on the verge of carrying out a nuclear test or several months into it, they haven't. Is any reason because uh, for that ha not happening because Xi Jinping has told Kim Jong-un not to carry out a nuclear test right now? Uh, I, I can't answer the question specifically. What I think what I would say is this. There's no motivation for the PRC to pull back any nation on the world that's generating a problem for the United States. Matter of fact, I'd argue quite differently that it's in their strategy to drive those problems. This is another problem. So I can't tell you if he said don't do it or do it. Uh, I can tell you there's been the most missiles launched in the previous decades. So their testing of uh, weapons delivery platforms has not slowed, it's increased. And if that was a concern to the PRC, uh, they have a pretty big hammer to, to execute over the DPRK as their only partner on the planet. So I would hope that those destabilizing activities that the PRC, if they're gonna act as a great power, they would take those actions because it's destabilizing to the entire region. And uh, again, while I don't have any information, uh, I would hope that would occur, but I'm not optimistic. Not optimistic about? About PRC doing anything helpful to stabilize the region. We just have a few more minutes um, and I'd like to come to uh an audience question, and Senator Rounds and Congressman Moulton, I think you'd be best suited to answer this. And the question is, what are the asymmetric advantages the United States needs to exploit in the Indo-Pacific? And, and you talked a bit about this, but if you could sort of go a bit deeper on that. Yeah, sure, no, no, look, look, with regard to the, the strategies that we need, number one, um, uh, our ability in AI has got to be increased dramatically. Uh, even the, some of the smaller countries in the world right now are, are recognizing. Seth and I actually traveled uh, to, to UAE where they have gone full in on, uh, on AI activities. AI critical. Uh, our cyber capabilities are second to none, but uh, we can't stop there. We're gonna have to incorporate AI into all of our cyber capabilities. Our space capabilities are spectacular. China knows it, but they're working very hard to be able to negate those areas. And finally, and, and that's an area that we have to continue to push to the outlink. Anybody that thinks that we're not gonna be having uh, 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 altercations in space is wrong. We are. Uh, it is at risk. And in a, any kind of an altercation with China, we will have battles in space. Finally, uh, with regard to the B-21, you talk about an opportunity to share with the entire world our capabilities that will carry weapon systems that have not yet been developed. We need the B-21 as quickly as we can get it and as many as we can get our hands on because it's one way to reach out and touch somebody that might now might not think we have the capabilities because they think they can stop our naval systems. They can't stop the B-21. And it's a great way to say deterrence is real and you don't want to mess with us. Before I come to you, Seth, Ms. Warden, when will the B-21 be operational? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> So the exact dates are classified for clear reasons, but we are working to get it in the hands of the US Air Force as quickly as possible, and I'm really proud of how the team has continued to remain on schedule. Congress Milton, um, I know I asked the question about the asymmetric advantage. I, I, if you could answer that, but I had another question as well, which is, is there any off-ramp to the competition and potential conflict with China? How do we not go straight into our conflict? How do we sort of veer away from it? What is the off ramp? Well, let me um, go back to the question you directed to Senator Rounds first. I, I completely agree with your answer. I, I'll just say this, that one way to look at this is we used to have a, say, 20-year head start or 20-year lead on China, right? And, and they have closed that gap. We're still ahead of them. 
we will still win a war against China. But if we want to widen that gap again, we cannot keep doing what we're doing because it hasn't worked. It's allowed them to catch up. You can't, keep, you can't count on winning a race two miles, with a finish line two miles down the road when your competitor is near to passing you and you still got two miles to go. So we have got to dramatically shift resources into the kind of asymmetric capabilities the Senator is talking about. And I'm not talking about you know, another billion dollars for AI, because that would be a huge change in our budget. I'm talking like 10 times that amount. I'm talking about taking a lot of money out of conventional systems, because you gotta have it come from somewhere, and shifting it into these asymmetric capabilities. If we really wanna regain that lead, that's what we have to do. Now look, in terms of an off-ramp, um, this is why the whole concept of integrated deterrence, or another way to put it is a whole of government approach to security, is so important. When I led the CODEL uh, in October to the Pacific, we looked at, of course, are the strategies being implemented? Are our allies ready to fight alongside? They're certainly ready at the mill-to-mill -mill level, but are they ready at the political level? And is all of this actually translating into deterrence? You know, I'm a Marine, so I laid out, that's our mission, those three, those three questions for, for our CODEL. And, and what, we, what we found is that we're doing a lot of the right things, but we're doing them not quickly enough. And we're not really painting this clear picture to China about what will happen, what will happen if they invade. And that requires as much work on the State Department's part, uh, on the private sector's part, on explaining to the world how we're gonna maintain our capability to produce chips, even if China thinks they've gonna, they're gonna take it over from Taiwan. These are all parts of the deterrence uh, picture. It's not just about how many missiles or F-35s do we have compared to theirs. Perfect, well I see the red light has gone off, so you could please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. Thank you.